visit to Hyderabad. I suspect Hyderabad is lucky for me. Thank you for asking me. I'm happy to be here. And thank you for coming to this lecture. I've sometimes wished that, like Humpty Dumpty in Alice in Wonderland, I could declare that words meant exactly what I wanted them to mean. They don't, of course. Meaning arises between the writer and the reader and is dependent on the cultural context. The words themselves are not newly minted coins with a precise definition. They come loaded with associations they've acquired through their long history. Every writer has to make it new, that is, has to say what she has to say in her own terms, otherwise what she makes are dead poems, copies. Uh, merely copying the past results in dead poems, but a male dominated literary tradition, a patriarchal history, and a foreign language, foreign in quotes, can weigh heavily on an Indian woman writing in English, particularly if she's also a feminist. I'd like to discuss how I've tried to deal with these considerations in my own work, and in turn ask you about your own experience. By mother tongue, I mean the language a writer writes in, whatever it is. In my instance, it happens to be English. Exoticism, that is, the fact that one might sound exotic in English, that India, by definition, is exotic, the Orient is exotic in that particular language. English words come from an English past and are rooted in the English landscape and in English history. I did not want to sound exotic writing in English. As far as I was concerned, I was merely human. But to pretend that there wasn't a problem would have marred my work. Sometimes, of course, no strategy is required at all, and all one needs is to overcome one's own self-consciousness. Discourse with the Dead is an elegy I, fan I finally managed to write for my father. Here is the opening poem. He died when she was ten in a distant country, and therefore the dreams wouldn't stop. She made nightly journeys, climbed out of bed, walked to the shore. Who is that sleeping giant? Not your father. Of his bones are coral made. She examined his body. His gills were slits, then heaved him up quickly on the palm of her hand like a gigantic balloon, like a bloated whale, hurried home with him. My problem here was not that my father was Indian or died in India, so much as my inability to get any distance in my grief. Once I could manage that, the rest was possible. And if I used a reference to the tempest in the process, why should I not? After all, I was writing in English. In this instance, I could ignore the question of exoticism. But a poem or a fable isn't written to formula, and the same strategy can't be used every time. Awareness of whether or not one is achieving the effect intended is essential. In The Giantess, I deliberately used the exoticism of the word India to create a sense of the distant and fabulous, so that the relevance of the fable to everyday life comes as a small shock. The giantess. Thousands of years ago, in faraway India, which is so far away that anything is possible, before the advent of the inevitable Aryans, a giantess was in charge of a little kingdom. It was small by her standards, but perhaps not by our own. Three oceans converged on its triangular tip. And in the north, there were mountains, the tallest in the world, which would perhaps account for the singular kingdom. It was not a kingdom, but the word has been lost, and I could find no other. There wasn't any king. The giantess governed, and there were no other women. The men were innocent and happy and carefree. If they were hurt, they were quickly consoled, for the giantess was kind and would set them on her knee and tell them they were brave and strong and noble. And if they were hungry, the giantess would feed them. The milk from her breasts was sweeter than honey and more nutritious than mangoes. If they grew fractious, the giantess would sing 
and they would clamber up her legs and onto her lap and sleep unruffled. They were a happy people, and things might have gone on in this way forever, were it not for the fact that the giantess grew tired. Her knees felt more bony, her voice rasped, and on one or two occasions she showed irritation. They were greatly distressed. We love you, they said to the tired giantess. Why won't you sing? Are you angry with us? What have we done? Your dear little children, the giantess replied, but I have grown very tired, and it's time for me to go. Don't you love us any more? We'll do what you want. We will make you happy. Only please don't go. Do you know what I want? The giantess asked. They were silent for a bit, and one of them said, We'll make you our queen. And another one said, We'll write you a poem. And a third one shouted, while turning cartwheels, We'll bring you many gifts of oysters and pearls and pebbles and stones. No, said the giantess, no. She turned her back and crossed the mountains. Now, <laughs> might seem very exotic and mysterious and so on, but ask any mother and she'll recognize exactly what goes on. You see, sexism occurs in many ways, some are subtle. But what I'm talking about here is exoticism. So. This was deliberately using the exoticism of India. In the conversations of Cow and St. Sunit and the Dragon, I use my own name in the text to make it clear that though the setting may be Canadian or English, the sensibility is Indian. In short, I have to use different strategies to deal with the, the fact that the language I am using does not necessarily adhere to my experience or to my way of seeing things. Then there's the question of audience. But then who am I writing for? An Indian audience or a Western one? What is a joke at the expense of Western notions of exoticism in the opening lines of the giantess is a shared joke for an Indian reader in the previous fable. And if I've been burdened or blessed, this thing is echoing, but anyway, and if I've been burdened or blessed with a dual awareness that a Western person and an Indian person will have to say what I have to say differently, then this too is something that I have to take into account in order to control the effect I create and not be controlled by it. For some poems and fables, the nature of the reader doesn't matter. I just assume a well-educated reader who understands the literary references and knows her Greek myths, though this itself can be problematic and carry on cheerful, cheerfully. But in Goza, I deliberately allow the Western reader to overhear what I say to Goza and my grandmother as I try to tell them what it was like living in the West. I admit, this account I'm now writing is for you and for the West. It's Janus faced. In short, there's a dual relationship, a readership, which allows each to hear what the other hears, though by themselves they hear very differently. Many of us as writers have a kind of dual hearing. That is, we know how something sounds to two different sets of people. This can inhibit us, but it can be an asset and add to the depth and power of our work. Western and Indian, feminist and anti-feminist, these are broad categories, but they do make a difference to how a piece of writing is understood and received. Here's an example. Now, this is called from the Panchatantra. In the holy city of Benares, there lived a Brahmin, who, as he walked by the riverbank, watching the crows floating downstream, feeding on the remains of half-burnt corpses, consoled himself thus. It is true that I am poor, but I am a Brahmin. It is true that I have no sons, but I myself am indisputably a male. I shall return to the temple and pray to Lord Vishnu to grant me a son. He went off to the temple, and Lord Vishnu listened, and Lord Vishnu complied. But whether through absent-mindedness, or whether for some other more abstruse reason, he gave him a daughter. 
the Brahmin was disappointed. When the child was old enough, he called her to him and delivered himself thus. I am a Brahmin. You are my daughter. I had hoped for a son. No matter. I will teach you what I know, and when you are able, we will both meditate and seek guidance. Though only a woman, she was a Brahmin, so she learnt very fast. And then they both sat down and meditated hard. In a very short time, Lord Vishnu appeared. What do you want? he said. The Brahmin couldn't stop himself. He blurted out quickly, I want a son. Very well, said the god, next time around. In his next incarnation, the Brahmin was a woman and bore eight sons. And what do you want? he said to the girl. I want human status. Ah, that is much harder. And the god hedged and appointed a commission. Now, now, because many young men and older men as well uh, are feminist in their attitudes, perhaps they find it funny as well. Also, administrators have had to deal with commissions and trying to make change. But I suspect that women find it funnier than men. The climate has changed in the past 25 years, at least in some countries, and there are men who are quite prepared to say they are feminists in the way that a person with a pink skin can say and mean it that she is anti-racist. In the 80s and 90s, those of us who were writing feminist books sometimes felt we were preaching to the converted. Others, especially men, and many women, were unwilling to listen. Now, the third thing I want to say is, that, is to talk about myths and the fact that myths mutate. Shared assumptions between the writer and the reader do help. But by making use of the context of her own text, the writer can subvert assumptions. The difficulty is that each time a writer uses a word, an image, a myth, she re reinforces its meaning. It's also true that by using it in a particular way and in a particular context, the writer can use the power that that word or that image has acquired for her own ends. Sometimes one can tell a story in more or less the traditional way and yet question it by giving it a particular setting, as I try to do in The Unloved Queen. This is from Blue and Other Stories, a book intended for children as well as adults, and for which Nilima Sheikh kindly did the artwork, as she feels that children too should have good illustrations. The Unloved Queen. Suniti and her grandmother were shelling peas in the sun. Why was I called Suniti? She asked her grandmother suddenly. Did you choose the name? I did suggest it, her grandmother admitted. Everybody thought it was a sweet sounding name. Just sweet sounding or does it mean something? Suniti persisted. She knew that people had the names of gods and goddesses, but she was fairly sure that no goddess had ever been called Suniti. It means someone who knows how to conduct herself, her grandmother explained. Someone who knows how to behave properly. Suniti wasn't sure she was always well behaved. She stole a glance at her grandmother and found her grandmother was smiling at her. Are um, people named according to who they are, she asked. She knew that the question didn't make sense, but how could she ask whether having a name which meant well behaved made her well behaved. Being given a name which means something good is like being given a blessing, her grandmother said. And yes, you usually are well behaved, and if you aren't sometimes, well, so what? Nobody's perfect. Suniti felt better, but she was still thinking about her name. I suppose she went on hesitantly, but there's no chance that Suniti was a goddess, or at least somebody noteworthy. Who was she? It was her grandmother's turn to hesitate. She was a queen, her grandmother replied. Suniti brightened. Was she a great queen, she asked eagerly, a much-loved queen? Well, no, her grandmother admitted. She was the unloved queen of a king called Uttanapada and her son Dhruva. And her son Dhruva was his unloved son. Why were they unloved, demanded Suniti. I don't know, answered her grandmother. 
What happened to them? What's their story? Suniti was beginning to feel quite indignant. When Dhruva was pushed off his father's lap, he was so hurt he went off the forest and meditated hard. Well, you know what happens in stories when someone meditates hard, her grandmother said. What are Suniti? A god appears, her grandmother told her. And so Lord Vishnu duly appeared and asked Dhruva what he wanted. I know what he wanted, Suniti interrupted. What asked her grandmother? He wanted to be loved, Suniti replied. Well, not exactly, her grandmother said. What he asked for was to be placed so high that he would never again be pushed aside. And that is why, my dear, Dhuwa was turned into the pole star. Suniti nodded and took that in. After a pause, she asked, And what about Suniti? What happened to her? Didn't she mind about any of this? For a moment, Suniti's grandmother didn't know what to say. Then she said, Well, no, she was well-behaved, you see. Still, in some versions of the story, she also became a star, though not a fixed star, like Dhuwa. Suniti looked at her grandmother. It says in my physics book that because of the continuous drift of the stars in relation to the Earth's axis, Pole stars change over the years. I see, said her grandmother. And what else does your physics book say? It says, Suniti told her, that every star is a mighty sun. Her grandmother laughed. And which do you like better, physics or myth? It depends on what they're telling me, Suniti replied, as she tipped the last of the peas into the bowl and watched them bounce among the other peas. I do not want to lose the richness of a language that comes loaded with the past, though some, of the a some aspects of the past may be unhelpful to me as a woman. I want to use that wealth for my own purpose, particularly as the genres in which I work are highly re referential. The short poem and the fable are condensed forms. They're dependent on reference for their effect. <coughs> it's the realization that the power of, of a myth does not lie in its commonplace interpretation, but in its capacity to mutate in a million different ways that is crucial. That is why writers use the same old min images and myths over and over again, and use them differently every single time. Myths mutate. That is their power. Once, one of my women's study students came out of a class on Milton in tears. She told me that the lecture had gone on and on about Eve, about how Eve had made Adam eat the apple and therefore caused the fall. She said that it made her feel awful, but she hadn't known what to say. I thought about it and wrote this fable. I don't know if it helped her, but it made me feel better. It's called the Saurian Chronicles. Uh, two lizards on a rock are sunning themselves. It's early in October. The rains have just stopped. The younger lizard, wishing to be amiable, says to the elder, O oh, wisest of lizards, O oh, long-lived one, tell me once again, if it is proper, of the world's beginning. The old lizard's tongue flickers for a moment. Her eyes cloud over. She opens her eyes and begins. Know then that the sun is a lizard, a fire-breathing dragon, and the earth is an egg. The sun warms the earth. That, my dear, is the essential wisdom. In the very beginning, as the great mother lizard warmed the earth, rocks split open, mountains cracked, and the giant lizards, our first ancestors, saw the light of the sun. Imagine, if you can, their gigantic proportions their fiery energy, their tremendous strength. Continents were their playing fields. They flew through the skies and sported in the oceans. The eggs that they laid gleamed like domes on the world's horizons. They were the mothers, the first mothers. And all would have been well had the mothers not asked the supreme mother for male companions. The sun in her bounty granted their wish. At first, the little fellows were playful and happy, but in time they turned to mischief 
and turned the mothers from the worship of the one. Then she grew angry. Her wrath was terrible. She punished the mothers. And that is why, my dears, we've all been reduced to such diminutive proportions. The old lizard stopped. The young lizard squirmed. There was something about the story that he didn't really like. But what could he say? It was the ancient wisdom. A long literary tradition sets up expectations about how a particular story goes or how a particular form works. Those very expectations can be used to say the unexpected. So uh, I don't really know, but it's a little bit like martial arts where you use the strength of the opponent to topple them. Then the question of poetry or, then the question of poetry or propaganda. When I sit, sit down at my desk every morning in the hope that a good poem or a fable will come to me, I don't say to myself, ha, and now I'm going to write, make a really good feminist point. What I really want to do is, is, is the best work that I'm capable of doing. And if I come up with assumptions in the language that are inimical to me, then I use my skill as a writer to subvert them. And it's fun. I'm functioning as a writer and as a feminist. Like many women and men who have stood up for women's liberation and gay liberation, I've had to pay a price. Reprobation from the family, dismissive remarks, that sort of thing. But on the whole, I've been lucky. I haven't been condemned as a heretic or as a blasphemer for insisting that myths mutate and that that is their power. Then the market. A book doesn't exist in a vacuum. You can't say, well, it's beautiful inside my head, therefore it's beautiful. It exists in the common cultural space. And in order to enter that space in the 21st century, it has to go through the marketplace. Publishers have to be willing to publish it, and readers have to be willing to buy it. In the 70s and 80s, those of us who were writing books that gave women a central place as human beings, and those of us who were reading them, thought it was all part of the cause. From the point of view of the market, however, feminist books were a particular type of product, and those who were buying them were the market target. I can make the hero of my Aditi series for children a strong-minded little girl and surround her with clever, powerful animals. But I'm not sure to what extent that makes things that makes to what extent that makes children think that girls too can be enterprising and brave. I suspect that popular soap operas are likely to be far more influential than anything a mere fabulist or a poet can do. I wish it wasn't true, but I fear it is. When J.K. Rowling <coughs> told the whole world that Dumbledore was gay. She probably did more to shift prejudice about gays than a hundred fables or poems could. It was a decent and generous gesture. The point is, though, that power permeates everything, whether in the form of money, publicity, or even sheer military might. It even permeates poetry and feminism. <coughs> the imbalance of power. It's not just a matter of women versus men gays versus straights, black versus whites, the rich versus the poor, and so forth. It's the imbalance of power that perpetrates injustice. As the gap between the powerful and the relatively powerless increases, the ugliness of what happens increases, till the powerful see themselves as the real humans and the powerless as something less than human. You recall that un really unpleasant remark of Do that Dr. Johnson made. Sir, a woman preaching is like a dog's walking on his hind legs. It is not done well, but you are surprised to find it done at all. From Boswell's Life of Johnson. He was wrong, of course, and if he deserves to be read, it is not because of his sexism, but in spite of it. What might have sound sounded witty and judicious to some ears in the 18th century sounds loutish in the 21st. As Jane Austen pointed out, albeit in a different context, what is needed is mutual respect. 
A writer's task is not just to take a good hard look at the world around her, but also to examine her own part in what is happening. Here's a passage uh, from uh, Suki, a memoir about my beloved cat. I know this sounds absurd, but it, it's really it's different from any other. I, yes, it is different from any other book about any cat. I began to suspect that Suki didn't have much use for what she th for what she thought of as the human obsession with morality. I wanted to know why, and one day she told me. It was early in September, leave something or the other. I was sitting at my desk trying to write. She was sitting on top of the desk. In fact, she was sitting on top of my uh, scribbling pad. And in a good humored way, she was trying to make me give up the struggle to write immortal verse and come out into the garden instead. I think you're absurd, she said, continuing to sit on top of my scribbling pad. Why, I demanded. Being so obsessed with morality and writing all these fables that are so concerned with justice and injustice. There are worse obsessions, I said stiffly. Oh, I don't mind your obsessions. They occupy you. It's just the way you think about these things that's so silly. Now, that was really insulting, but I wanted to know why. I wanted to know what she meant, so I decided not to be insulted and asked her what she meant. Well, your notion for justice, for instance, replied Suki carelessly. It seems to be a matter of obeying a given set of rules. But if the setup within which the rules must be obeyed is unfair in the first place, then wherein lies justice? I was lost. What do you mean, I repeated. Well, if everybody has a certain amount of property, uh, by everybody I mean every human body, well, the rules say you mustn't take away someone else's property. But if everyone doesn't have the same property in the first place, then how is that fair? Oh, I see, I said in a superior fashion. You're a socialist or a communist. Nonsense, Suki reported. Card-carrying cats don't exist. Well, I said, let's assume that human justice is imperfect. What do you have against the human quest for morality? I dislike it, Suki said very clearly, because it's so self-absorbed and self-glorifying. I was beginning to feel more and more cross, but I wanted to know what she really thought. So I repeated, what do you mean? Oh, you know, she said, yawning at me as though it was something so self-evident it hardly needed explaining. The usual scenario, man at the center, pitted against the rest of the universe, trying heroically to save his soul, to what she or he they generally mean he, is usually trying to save is his own skin. What's wrong with that, I asked. I thought it was a reasonable question. Human beings, replied Suki, now sounding thoroughly bored and, prepared, and preparing to go into the garden on her own. Human beings are only another species. Oh, all that animal rights stuff, I said nastily, hoping by my manner to deliver a snub. Why not, replied Suki. I am, after all, an animal. And I could say in the same way, I am, after all, a woman. Keep talking at her and she doesn't like it. She, I have to bribe her sometimes with cat biscuits. But anyway, one day I say to her, then how do we start behaving more justly? Uh, I don't know, uh, replied Suki. I was just telling you a story. She tells me a story before this about us going off in a spaceship. Um, I was just telling you a story. I didn't know what to say. Um, so I asked, um, well, what about poems, I asked, because she's been talking about stories. Oh, poems are different, Suki said carelessly. Your fables are about justice. So your fables are different from mine. But the poems, if I were to write poems, would probably be the same. What do you mean, I asked, feeling slightly stupid. She seemed so sure of herself. Poems are about time, she said, blinking at me, out of her great golden eyes. Poems are about living and dying. And for any living creature, that probably is much the same. To write involves a struggle with language. And that's what I've been talking about. But 
that doesn't mean that one has to be constantly embattled. To write is also to celebrate. And I'll conclude with a loved poem. So that there's enough time to hear what um, all these distinguished writers here have to say, but also what all of you have to say. Let, let me finish with this. This particular poem is dependent on the, it, it uses the imagery of the Alice in Wonderland books. All the words have leaped into air, like the cards in Alice, like birds flying, forming, reforming, swerving and rising. And each word says it is love. The cat says it is love. It says, I am and I love. And the fawn in the forest who lost his name, he eats from your hand, he tells you, my name is love. And all the white knight's baggage rattles and cries it is love. And even the tiger lily, even the rose, say only that they are themselves, and they say they are love. All the little words say they are love. The space in between, the link and logic of love. And I can make no headway in this heady grammar. And suddenly and here, you are, I am, and we love. Thank you.